Now we can move into section two, where we're going to cover process IDs, variables, and the file system. Now, PID versus PPID. PID is the process ID. That's pretty much your unique identifier assigned to each running process. This is going to be this column here for PID. PPID, parent. So this is the parent process ID. And it is the PID of the parent process that spawned the current process. So here, remember we talked about init? And we said init would always have the PID of one. Well, if we look for what has the PID of one here, we go all the way across, sbin launch D. So I'm on a Mac host here. Launch D is an init and operating system service. It's the management daemon created by Apple. So very similar. Uh, it's a, it, it, is, it is an init daemon and it just looks displayed here as sbin launch D. So it's the same thing. This is an init daemon. The PID is going to be one. And if we see all of these following processes have the parent PID of one. So everything over here was all spawned by the init daemon because their parent PID is one. So if you read this chart and you go back to, oh, the process that the parent PID was one, what process is one, you can find out what process launched what process and it gives you a parent-child relationship of processes running. Uh, this was executed just with the ps tac elf command to get a list of all your processes running and some switch options to format it as such. So I definitely would be familiar with PID versus PPID. When we're talking about processes, it's also beneficial to cover killtac 9 versus pkill. So killtac 9 it's going to forcefully terminate a process by sending the sigkill signal. Um, and it cannot be ignored, so it's extremely forceful. It's going to kill it. The syntax would be kill tac 9 and then the PID, the process ID, of the process that you're trying to kill. So if I wanted to kill um, just this last line here, uh, user libexec rem, that'd be a terrible decision, but I could do kill tac 9 and then the PID 121, and it would forcefully kill that process. Another similar command is pkill. So this is process kill, and it's a command used to send a signal to one or more processes, and the buzzword is killing it by name or attributes. So you would do pkill, your switch options, and then your pattern. You can do, um, you know, if I just wanted to kill Splunk that was running on my system, I could find the PID of Splunk and do killtac 9 associated to the Splunk D process that's running, or if I did pkill and then just Splunk, it's going to match everything within the name that is named Splunk. So I could do pkill, my switch options, and then Splunk D, and that will kill it by name. And there may be one or more process running Splunk D, uh, and it's, it's less granular of a kill command to a process. So when you use killtac 9 you are targeting one specific process by its process ID and terminating it immediately. When you use pkill, you are targeting one or more processes based on names or attributes uh, useful to help or stop multiple processes at once when you don't know the pit of the process you want to stop. Um, definitely two commands to be familiar with and definitely you should be aware of what PID is and ppid and how to read the output of uh, the ps command in Linux. Variables. Obviously, we're, we're in Linux. We want to cover certain invariables. We can use the invariables command, the env here, to list out all of the current invariable, uh, environment variables I have set on my Mac host here. A variable is a named container used to store data, such as text, text strings, numbers, file names, they can be used in shell scripts and commands to store values that can be manipulated or referenced through a script or the command. In Linux, variables are referenced using the dollar sign symbol followed by the variable name. So example, if we had dollar sign my variable, that would be the reference to it. And you can echo this out as we'll see in the next command or the next slide, going over some demonstrations of looking at variables on my Mac. This tells the shell to substitute the value of the variable in place of the variable name when the script or command is executed. 
So all of these, if we wanted to reference them, will have the prefix of the dollar sign. They can also be set using the equal operator. If you wanted to change the variable, um, let's say I wanted to change my variable of PWD, my print working directory, I can give it um, PWD equals and then set a new path that I wanted to have and echo it out again and see that the variable has changed. So this is probably better described on the next slide with some examples. So some variables that you should be familiar with, dollar sign home. This is the path to a user's home directory. This is also known as the tilde. So if you did CD and then tilde, it would also take you to your home directory. So echoing out, echo is just a command to print to the screen, whatever you are echoing out. And it's saying echo out the variable of home, like what is my home value is what I'm asking the command line. And it will tell me, oh, the variable's value is set to users, Haley Shaw. Another one, dollar sign shell. This is basically what shell you're in. I'm in a Z shell. We talked about the different types of shells you can have in the intro to Unix module. And you can change your preference for what shell you're in or operating in by changing um, your shell variable or what shell you launch into. Those are all configurable on whatever Unix-like system you're operating on. Lastly, we also have dollar sign path. It's basically storing a list of directories separated by colons here, which the shell searches when trying to locate executable files. You can also customize this and change the shell's configuration files. Maybe some um, terminology to be familiar with is the dot bash RC or your bash profile. This is where you can customize your environment and your profile within Linux. So if you want to go cat these out, take a look at what your current settings are, it would give you a stronger understanding of your uh, profile that's currently set. Just wanted to make you aware of home, shell, and path, uh, and give you some examples of variables. Moving into the file system, everything in Linux is a file or directory. We're going to have a slide next that covers the difference at a high level, kind of the major differences between the Linux file system and the Windows file system. So Linux, just think of everything as a file. This makes it easier to manipulate and manage resources using a consistent set of commands. A term that you should be familiar with is an inode. This is short for index node. It is a data structure that contains metadata about a file or directory. Each file or directory on a Linux file system has a unique inode that identifies it and stores its information about the file's ownership, permissions, timestamps, and other attributes. In Linux, we still have our MacB timestamps, with C being the last change to the inode, the new terminology that we can kind of incorporate since we covered Mac timestamps in Windows. They're very, very similar in a Linux for modified access and change to the inode. And another terminology to be familiar with is the virtual file system. This is an extraction layer in the Linux kernel that provides a consistent interface to various types of file systems, regardless of their underlying implementation or physical location. The virtual file system allows applications and users to interact with the files and directories on different file systems using the same set of system calls and commands. So you can have different operating systems here and the kernel will still be able to interact with them, leveraging the virtual file system. Again, we covered the kind of three main parts of the architect here. And the last terminology to be aware of for the file system is a hard link versus a symbolic or soft link. A hard link will point directly to the inode of the original file, while symbolic links contain a reference to the path of the original file. So over here, we have our hard link, this is going to point directly to the inode for where the file is residing on disk. Where is that file located? It's a hard link. It is a direct path. Whereas the soft link is going to kind of take an indirect route and it's going to have like a reference to be like, oh, I know that the, uh, the inode reference is on this original file. The original file can find the inode. So I'm going to give you a soft link for grabbing that information. So pretty much direct path versus 
indirect path. Hard links can only be created within the same file system, while soft links can be created between different file systems. And to kind of see the information, you can use the ln command on the command line to get information uh, about your inodes. Good chart here summarizes the top differences between the Linux and the Windows file system. So Linux, remember, this is a hierarchical structure with everything starting at the parent directory of root. And then we go down into our other categories. We had the hierarchical chart displayed in the previous modules for Etsy, bin, sbin, uh, users, etc. It has the single root directory and all the directories are, stru are structured underneath that at the hierarchical level. In Windows, you can kind of have multiple root directories. I'm sure you've seen if you've ever plugged in external media, it'll give a D drive or an E drive. You can allocate different root directories with C or D, E, F, as many as you want to onboard or allocate your uh, partitions in file system structure. Linux, case sensitive. So file.txt is not going to be referenced the same as lowercase file.txt. Linux is case sensitive. Windows, it is not case sensitive for referencing. Linux offers a flexible permission system that allow users to control access to files, directories at the user and group levels. Windows, less flexible. The best example I can give is if you go in to change a setting about an, an object, you have to, you know, you have the box that comes up and you go through all the widgets and you have another box that pops up and maybe like even another one. You have to click apply changes and then hit the okay box. And then you kind of go down and hit apply, okay, apply, okay again. It's definitely not as flexible. Uh, again, that comes down to everything being a file in Linux. And then in Windows, everything's kind of treated like an object with a unique identifier called a handle. Um, getting into like digital forensics handle, you don't need to have a strong understanding of what it is. Mostly compare Linux, everything being a file, and Windows, everything kind of being treated like an object. You know, we talked about GPOs, group policy objects. That's kind of how things are managed in Windows at the object level. Linux, you can have the extended file system version 4, BTRFS, extended file system, and others. Whereas Windows, remember, we're really thinking about the new technology file system, the NTFS and FAT32 um, legacy type file system structure. In Linux, there have been several versions of the extended file system that have been developed over the years, including version 2, 3, and most modern. Uh, like if you download Ubuntu and start working with it today, it's going to be using ext4. So hopefully this chart kind of gives you the top comparisons. You know, if you were asked on an interview, what's really the main difference between Linux and Windows operating system? You can give them five great examples here, and that would be a phenomenal answer. A review of important files. So in the previous module for intro to Nix, we covered Etsy past WD, Etsy shadow, and Etsy group, kind of broke down how those were segregated out. Here we have our Etsy past WD uh, file here. And remember, the most important thing is where are the passwords, the hashed passwords stored for our users. It's not in Etsy past WD, it's in Etsy shadow. So just wanted to reiterate that point here. Commands that create or alter the fields within Etsy shadow or Etsy past WD. We have user add, you can create a user. So we're adding a user or update a current user with the tac D switch option. Pass WD, that's going to update the user's authentication tokens or modify their password settings, give them a new password. User mod, we're making a modification to a user. So we're changing parameters that were set with user add when we added them to be like, oh, I want to modify this change to this user. User del, we're deleting a user. And the ID command, that's going to print your UID and GID. So just wanted to call out, you know, five or so commands that kind of get you thinking about what these files do for authentication and authorization and some commands that we would use that we covered on the other side to be like, oh, Obviously, if we add a user or move a user or change or modify a user, these files are also going to be updated. Another file that's new that we haven't covered yet is the Etsy host file. Definitely think this one is worth calling out. 
It's pretty much a file that's going to have your local reference for IP to domain name. So if I cat out, remember cat is to print or concatenate the files and kind of type it to the screen. If we cat out the Etsy host file, this is where I have an IP. My loopback is set to local host. My broadcast is allocated to this. My loopback for IP version six is that. And you know, I have OpenVPN client installed. That is the IP assigned to client.openvpn.net. So why are we talking about Etsy host? I wanted to call this out because if you're gonna pursue a career in cybersecurity, you need to understand the basics of Etsy hosts because think about how attackers can leverage this file. If they go in and they modify your Etsy host file, they can redirect you to malicious sites based on whatever IP they put in. They can point it to a command and control channel or carry out phishing attacks. So any kind of command line that you would see modifying the Etsy host file should definitely be reviewed and trying to get you into the mindset of we're learning these basic terminologies uh, within Windows and Linux and how they can be leveraged to attackers to modify them. And you can't understand that without a basic definition of, well, what is the Etsy host file? So it's your simple name resolution, IP to domain, local lookup for your computer to reference to be uh, a reference point for the system to go out and resolve and keeps it local on the computer.